Mike, <laughs> absolutely incredible to have you on the call again. And thank you so, 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 so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, congratulations. You've got a new book coming out. Thank Very you. excited to chat about that. And, uh, and well done on, uh, on, on everything. I, I see lots of great things about the Happiness Museum. There's lots of things that have happened since we last chatted. So uh, yeah, what, what an honor. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Welcome. Mark. Thanks for having me, Chris. Always, always fun uh, and a pleasure to talk with you. Same, same. Um, so, new book, My Hugger Home. I've got some of your other books up here. Wow. Okay, you it's got the big. copy. It's, I, it does I, look bigger. I see you have the little book of Hugger. I think this is the big book of Hugger. It's, it's, I think it's twice the size, actually, of the, oh, uh, wow. of the original Hugger book. Are you, are you going to, are they getting progressively bigger? Because I can see the first they two are. here are the same they size. Are. The, the they third are. one's a bit bigger. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> They're, 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 they're following the, um, the size of my ego, basically. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, uh, I, you're very down to earth. It's, uh, you're, you're an amazing person to hang around. So it's, I think your ego is uh, brilliant. <laughs> when, uh, when you made this, this book, uh, was there a particular reason why you wanted to make a, a book about the home now? Um, yes. So actually the idea came. I think oh, six years ago, seven, oh, five, five wow. years ago, when, when, when the first Hugo book was published and you read it. And, and for those that haven't, yeah. there, there is, there is an entire chapter around lighting in the little book of, of Hugo. Um, the rule of thumb is the warmer, the temperature, the softer, the light, the more Hugo the lighting and Hugo is about sort of creating a nice atmosphere and after I had published that book, I spoke to a, a Canadian journalist and he had read about, he read my book and he read about lighting and uh, Danes use a lot of candles because they give off this nice, soft, warm light. And he said that he read that and then he went home and he bought some uh, candle holders and he started to light candles for dinner at home with his family. And him and his wife at the time, they had three teenage sons uh, and I think two 15 year olds and an 18 year old. And, and at first, when he started to light the candles for dinner, teenage boys being teenage boys said, you know, dad, you know, started to tease him. What's going on with the candles? Do you want to have some romantic time with mom? Should we leave? <laughs> um, and uh, it turned out, you know, over time, it actually became the boys that started to light the candles for dinner. And it became this ritual for the family. And what I really liked, he said, was that, you know, the family dinners now lasted 15 to 20 minutes longer. And, you know, instead of sort of sitting down, shoveling down their food, the, the different atmosphere around the table, because of the lighting, put the boys in a storytelling mode or mood. Mm -hmm. And sort of, you know, they sipped their wine, they talked about their day. And I thought it was, it was such a nice example of how a little simple design change around a dinner table uh, impacted how a family interacted. And that became the first sort of, sort of seed in, could we look at other design hacks around your home that could sort of stack the deck in your favor in terms of achieving happiness? And I think also another element in all this was you know, of course, being Danish, you grew up with, with design and the importance of that. But it was also sort of, you know, the global pandemic and also now sort of war in Europe. And, and there's a lot of turbulence going on. And a home is a zone we can, to some extent, control. And um, mm -hmm. we spend a lot of time at home. And we've done at the Happiness Research Institute different studies that show the importance of our homes when it comes to our mental health and well-being. Um, so it was sort of those puzzles that, that started to merge, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and the working title was, uh, the architecture of happiness, yeah, but that title somebody else stole, uh, <laughs> or had, had written a book about. So, <laughs> so we went with, uh, with my Hugo home as well. So it's about, yeah, it's about Hugo. It's about design. It's about how to turn your home into, or your house into a home and sort of, sort of harness, uh, the architecture of, of happiness, basically. I'd, I'd imagine if uh, if the candles had that effect on fifteen and eighteen year old boys, then that's the ultimate test. Uh, right. If it works on that demographic, <laughs> probably going to work on anyone. Um, 
true did uh, did you make it with with the with the journalist at all or is it just uh, just based on 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 your your research and the and the things that you've been finding it's 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 based on the research we do at the happiness research right. institute but also other research that have been done in this field um so i mean some of the work that we have done we looked at um at, I think it was 13,000 homes in 10 European countries at the Happiness Research Institute, looking at um, how they impact happiness and quality of life and found that, you know, if you're happy with your home, you're very likely to be happy overall and that happiness with your home could explain, I think it was 15% of your overall happiness. Um, we could also then see which factors in your home have a bigger impact on happiness than others, for example, um, having good daylight, uh, having uh, enough space. Um, the interesting part is it's spaciousness. It's not the actual size of your house that matters, which I think is really important to, to underline. Um, so, so we could see that, that, that uh, homes have a big impact on happiness. And it's something that also um, the World Health Organization have pointed towards. Uh, they find that if you have inadequate daylight in your home, uh, you are 60% more likely to become depressed. Um, there's also a super cool study at the in, in the UK, actually. There's the um, millennial cohort studies where uh, 12,000 kids born around the year 2000 have been followed in their childhood and then uh, when they grow up. And you can see when these kids were seven, 50% uh, of the kids had a TV in their bedroom. And four years later, those 50% that had TV in the bedroom uh, have a 25 higher risk of being obese when they're 11 years old. So we, we can see many different ways that the way we design our homes, what we put in our bedrooms and our kids' bedrooms, um, how we interact as a family around the dinner table, that is actually something that you know design have an influence over. So it, it, I wanted to bring attention to that uh, and help people understand the design choices they make around their home and how that sort of impact uh, well-being. Well, I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, the, I mean, the, the TV thing is nuts. Um, I, I didn't realize how much that yeah that, that affects um, happiness. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's interesting just randomly seeing how many of my friends make an active choice to kind of either not have a TV or to, to hide it in, in another room and kind of <laughs> a bit locked away for special occasions away from their kids. Exactly. Um, and the, you were saying it's, so it's sort of fif roughly 15% of your happiness um, is is linked to, to, to the home. And then I'd imagine that <clears throat> I was, again, having a conversation the other day with some friends about the difference between renting and owning. Uh, I, I don't know whether you ever found any, any research on that because we were saying that renting is is in a way mentally probably a lot, lot easier and that you know if circumstances change it's much easier for you to then leave and go to a different place or if something terrible happens to your home at least you can you can leave and get it sorted whilst if something you know terrible happens to your home if you right. it's yours it's it's often you know catastrophic <laughs> can really change your uh, your lifestyle did you have any 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 insights into yeah, yeah. so so learning? actually the big study we did uh around happiness at home in the 10 European markets um, with 12 or oh, 13,000 homes. We did look at whether being an owner or renter impacted uh, your, your happiness with your home and, and overall happiness. And we did find that in some countries, for instance, in the UK, we could see being a home owner um, is, is a factor in, 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 in happiness. It wasn't the case in Germany, for instance. Uh, renters oh, and wow. homeowners are equally happy. And what we think is at play is the sort of social comparison effect. Um, renting is far more common in Germany compared to the UK, also compared to Denmark. And social comparisons is also, it, it's often a big uh, theme in happiness research that uh, people care more the, more about their relative income than their absolute income. So, you know, you know, of course, it matters how much I'm able to sort of purchase and consume, but it it matters more how I feel I'm doing financially compared to my reference group. 
and and that is probably also what we're seeing here with 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 homes if all your friends are homeowners then that's the norm and then if you are not owning your own home then you feel you're sort of behind or um not as if you don't feel as, as sort of financially secure or or, or or accomplished as your friends um so so if we can detach ourselves from what norms are and what the sort of yeah. Uh, what we feel the right thing to do is, then, 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 then we can sort of remove the power that home ownership has uh, over our happiness levels. I mean, I, mean, I guess those social norms are a, are a factor in a lot for different things in, in happiness. Um, are, are there any kind of things that you, you've seen people do or, or, or anything that you kind of recommend to people to try and make them more aware to detach themselves from, from sort of judging how they're doing compared to others. Is that, if that think, makes sense. I, mean, I think, I think we actually, I think we cover this in, in the, at least one of the happiness courses uh, we, we've done together yeah. with, with you in terms of, for example, social media, being aware of the impact it, it can have on us when our sort of social media feed is a constant bombardment of great news that happens for everybody else. Um, and instead of focusing, focusing so much on what other people are doing and what other people have, then sort of consider, am I in a better place today than I was one to five years ago? Um, but yeah. of course it's, 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 uh, it, it can be challenging. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, there's a slightly off topic, but, uh, just, just, <laughs> just intrigued to know the answer. Um, so when you're, let's go back to, back to the house. So you, I, I was reading, um, some of the tips uh, from the from the book preview it's talking a lot about the importance of creating spaces in your home um, and I saw there was there was one about uh, creating a, a space for shelter or a space for privacy um, yeah I mean what, what what's that about and I mean I'm because I'm, I'm guessing this is a great book and for now and that I mean probably would have been even more helpful two years ago but um <laughs> But no, it's still very helpful because we are, I think, all spending so much more time at home. And most yeah. people I know are having a hybrid sort of work model. Right. Um, so, yeah, yeah think, the, the, the privacy thing. Yeah, yeah, the privacy and the shelter thing, which are actually two two things. But but in the right. book, I've sort of structured it um, around Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, which I think makes a lot of sense from a happiness point of view. And sort of shelter is the sort of very sort of foundation uh, in terms of our needs. And of course, our homes provide that. Um, and also it's, it's that sort of area where we do have some control over what is happening compared to the sort of wider uh, turbulent world. Um, but you also write about the privacy element that we need our homes to retreat to. We really enjoy taking part in, in community and we can see what people look for when they are looking at neighborhoods is sort of a, a village feeling, even though they might be living in a bigger city. Uh, they like to know the, the, the names of their neighbors. They like to be able to borrow sugar and milk and so on. Um, but they also really need to retreat. Um, and I thought it was super interesting. We, we recently did a, another study where we looked at row houses in Copenhagen and in the, in the, in the UK. Um, Birmingham, I believe it was. And, and in Copenhagen, some, some of the most coveted houses in Copenhagen is 11 streets in a neighborhood called the Potato Rose. And uh, <laughs> uh, long story, but, but um, so, so these row houses, they have a small front yard and a backyard. And in the front yard, um, that's where people sit and drink coffee and read the newspaper and talk to their neighbors and so on. In the backyard, even though they're really close and even though they might even be able to see the other neighbors, the culture is that there's a consensus around we don't talk to each other in the backyard because we want to give right. this sort of illusion of being private. So, so this is where we retreat to in our gardens. I thought that that was an interesting thing, but I think that's a, a, a sort of common human desire to be able to retreat to places to sort of re-energize and relax. So I think that's also something we need to keep in mind when we are designing our homes. Where can I be in sort of complete peace? Um, either from the, the, the sort of street, but perhaps also sometimes, you know, we need, even though we are part of a family, to sort of just be our, ourselves and have, have, have quality alone time. Um, and 
I also in the book talk about sort of the importance of 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 preparing for winter if we want to go sort of Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> um, that, that 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 sort of Hugo is also about sort of expecting winter. Um, Hugo right. is about sort of finding shelter in turbulent times. Um, in Sweden, there, there's sort of a national advice that you should have, I think it's seven days wor worth of food and water in your home. Um, and that's also something I advise uh, people to, um, to do in the book, to, to sort of be more mindful of their pantry and sort of have food prepared. Um, consider what you would do if you were snowed in for five or seven days. You know, what would you do? What would you live on? Um, and there's a lot of joy in cooking. Um, and it's, it's, it's a super important element, I think, in how to create a Hugo home to focus on the family meal and cooking in general. And interestingly, when you ask people in the UK what makes a house a home, the top five has nothing to do with things. The first thing we see is on seventh place, that's a sofa. <laughs> Uh, but the first things are love, laughter, belonging, uh, the smell of home cooked food and family dinners. Um, and unfortunately, family dinners in a lot of countries, including uh, the UK, is on decline. Um, a lot of people, the majority of people say that they had more family dinners when they were growing up than they do now. Um, mm. So that's that's something I would really like to change. And that's also why I thought that story from our Canadian reader was so interesting that he did a little design hack around the dinner table and now their family dinners last longer. Um, and I'm really curious to, to sort of understand how can we, you know, how can we spend less time at the kitchen table, but more time at the dinner table. And uh, one of the suggestions in the book is to eat artichokes, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, uh, which is a, it's a great food, but it, it's basically one hour of prep, prep time. So it's boiling water, salt in it, half a lemon, and then boil the artichokes for 35, 45 minutes. And I, being a nerd and being a numbers guy, I measured the average length of our family dinners and then saw what's the average impact in terms of length when we have artichokes. And our dinners last 12 minutes longer when we have artichokes because <laughs> it's a really slow uh, slow food to eat. So you peel off the leaf and you, you, you yeah. dip them in butter or oil and then you sort of suck off the, the sort of meat from the, from the leaf. So things like that uh, where we can, you know, uh, if we do uh, wraps or tortillas, you know, when you, you slice up some, some vegetables and then you get your family or your friends to sort of assemble their own food. So get cooking and, and sort of get sort of, you know, good people around a, 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 a table with good food that's a very good starting recipe for happiness. So that, that's also what the book is about. How can we sort of have more really good quality dinners with our family and friends? That's fascinating. And uh, it makes so much sense when you think about it, that, that occasions and things like the smell of food would, would work. And wow, that was probably very good news for uh, a lot of those companies that are coming out now in the UK. There's one called Mindful Chef. There's lots of them where you sort of, yeah, they, they give you the meals and you have to make them. And, uh, yeah, I think it, it, yeah, I think we've been trying that ourselves. It's actually really nice. It brings us both together because I don't know about you. We always find that quite often one of us will keep working and then we'll take it in turns to make food and then they just say, Oh, we're ready. Okay. Okay. And then it's so the quickly eat together and then, you know, go off or spend a bit. So it's, I think you're absolutely right. So when you make something together, it's, yeah, it does make it, it, it feel, you yeah. feel so much so and better. Another study said the majority of people in the UK wish they had more family dinners and say it's yeah. it's the most important quality time to have they have together as a family or, or as a couple. So I think that there's wow. so much happiness to be sort of harvested from that activity. Um, and also, I mean, with the, with the sort of cost of living going up in terms of you know eating out and so on, eating at home is 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 cheaper. It's it's healthier. So there's a, there's a lot of benefits benefits from it. And also on yeah. that, in, in the book, I talk about how Hugo is also the good life on a low budget. It's, it's, it's using what we have or make do. Is that how you say it in, yeah. in English? Yeah. Make do, yeah. Um, and I think it's, it, it's, 
it's a shame and that happens in Denmark as well. There's a lot of, of, of food waste going on. I can see that the average UK family uh, throws out uh, 750 pounds of food each year, which is, is you know, unfortunate, especially these days, the cost of food is going up, maybe yeah. it's a thousand pounds now. Um, and then I think there's actually some simple hacks to, to counter that. So in our fridge, uh, we have what I call the hospice shelf or the retirement shelf. <laughs> so there I put the, 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 the food, the ingredients we have to eat in the next day or two. And it's the most visible shelf in the fridge. So every time I open it, I'm just confronted with, okay, uh, that salad, the leaf are going a little bit brown. We need to eat it uh, soon. And that salmon, we need to work that into lunch or dinner or somehow. Um, so, so simple hacks like that minimize uh, food waste. Also, keep a list of what you have in the freezer on your phone and, um, <laughs> and, and, and write down when you put stuff in the freezer, what's in the, what's in the box. Um, I think to quote Brad Pitt in Seven, what's in the box? But, uh, but, <laughs> but or in, in a container or if you put it in a plastic bag, because you might have some left, leftover, um, you know, bolognese, if you had spaghetti bolognese and, yeah. and, you know, you put it in a, in, in a bag and you think, okay, I'm going to remember that this is bolognese. And then three months go by and you put in five other things that are sort of brownish in color <laughs> in your freezer and you have no idea what it is. And then you end up either having spaghetti with dark ragu or you, you throw uh, things uh, in the fridge, right? So, so thing, simple things like that, that can help us you know, make do with what we have, reduce food waste, have more family dinners. Um, that, that's what I've been trying to do with the book. That's genius. And then I the enjoy freezer... food, so I'm just sort of, <laughs> it's, yeah. it was also a way yeah. for me to sort of, um, to sort of uh, write about what I'm, what I'm passionate about privately. Yeah, I'd imagine. And the, uh, the out of sight, out of mind thing of the freezer is, is genius. Like, I, right. almost makes me think that they should invent a, a, some sort of a, a screen, <laughs> like an LED screen that's, uh, for your freezer so that you can see what's actually in there. Cause it's, yeah. Uh, because yeah, then when right. you're at, at the grocery yeah. store and you think, what should I have for dinner tonight? Right. And then you go over, okay, right. I have some leftover red curry. Uh, there is some chicken, there are some peas. Okay. We already got something going there, those three ingredients, and then you can add whatever you need for, for that price. Right? Um, yeah. so yeah, it, it, I think it just helps, uh, and, and, and make every day a little bit easier and hopefully happier. Oh, that's amazing. Were, were there any other occasions apart from sort of meal times that, they, that, that you found that, that were kind of key or? Um, I mean, I, I, there's also sort of an entire chapter around lighting again, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, because we can see that has a big impact on, on people's uh, mental health. Um, you know, having access to daylight, um, like the WHO yeah. said, well, that reduces your, your risk of depression, but also how we use artificial lighting in, uh, uh, our home has an impact. There are some really, really cool studies that have been done in Danish schools, where they, instead of having this sort of uniform white bright light in the ceiling, have I think you call them pendles. That's sort of sort of uh, downward facing lights above right. tables, and that sort of brings the kids up to the table and do their work there instead of rolling around on the floor in in in, in the classroom. And there was a, there was a PhD uh, student who did a study on it. I can see that the, the different lighting in the classroom reduced the uh, decibel levels of the, the noise in, in, in the classroom significantly. So, so you know, like lighting spot, matters. Spotlights. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, down lights. Down lights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, that's, that's amazing. That's fascinating. And it was, was color or warmth of the light. So I, I noticed whenever I've been lucky enough to, to come to Copenhagen, um, you know, everyone seems to all be, uh, you know, singing from the same, uh, the same song that the, the lighting is always amazing. And if you look in someone's house, it's sort of almost like a glow, an orange glow. It looks like a warm, a warm fire. Um, whilst if you, you know, walking around London, you'll often look up and it looks like someone's got a, a, a blue white light, you know, right. shining in there. It looks like a hospital or something. It's, uh, yeah. it, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a big thing, I think, in, in, in Denmark and Danish design. And, and you're right, 
in a lot of homes you'll find what we call Hugo lighting, which are like you described, this sort of orange warm lights or sort of islands of light around the living room, which is good for sort of relaxing. It also makes people look nicer. We call it looking grotto <laughs> fabulous. Um, but but there, there's also moments for that blue white light you, you, you described from, you, you said from London or from Paris. Right. Uh, because if you're doing the dishes, you don't want Hugo lighting because then you're going to have that <laughs> leftover red curry that you had last night on it. Right. So, right. so I think the, 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 the key is to have options for different kinds of light, um, that you need within that room. So if you're doing, um, when you're doing the dishes, you need a different light. Um, when you're working, uh, you need a different light compared to when you're in a relaxing mode or when you're having a romantic dinner with, with your wife or when you're having friends over for drinks. Um, so, 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 so understanding what the function are of the different rooms and understanding how you need different lights for different functions. I think that's, that's the first step. So it's a great advert also for Philips Hue light bulbs. <laughs> and you for can... I have, the, yeah, the, I haven't you know, tried the those, but um, can can you turn them up and down in terms of uh, sort of warmth and? Uh... Yeah, I've, I mean, I've I've got them. I've turned my phone off, but uh, yeah, the, all the lights in here they can go from you know, whatever color you want. Um, but uh, I mean, what when you said uh, there was a, there was a better color for working what was did you find out what that color was? Is it yeah, you... is it more of a bright white yes. light or yeah, yeah. right? Okay. Is that because uh, I always try and keep mine still on warm lighting? So that's probably why I, I sometimes feel quite tired <laughs> when I'm working. But, all right, I'll remember also, that tip. There's also time of day, right? That that you need right. uh, some light for for uh, certain times of day. Okay. And basically, that's also amazing. because of, of electric prices going up, you know, harness <laughs> as much daylight as you can. Um, so I have really good lighting in the uh, in the morning down by my work desk. So I try to stay there. Now it's a it's a grey day in Copenhagen, so there's no daylight anywhere. But <laughs> but in the evening, uh, it'll be on the other side of the house. Uh, so basically, think like you're a cat. You know, go where the daylight is. Uh, that that that's also a way to to achieve uh, oh, better lighting at home. When, I mean, I wonder when you were making the book, did you find were there anything was there anything that you found that you're going to use to change in your own house, or that you have already changed in your own house? Um, the the the, the um. The hacks around uh, food are really used a lot, and and I obsess over now what I have in the freezer and what is on the <laughs> hospice shelf. Um, and also, I enjoy cooking, but I I, I enjoy eating more. Uh, so 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 finding good recipes where um, I can quickly create a a, a nice meal uh, that that can get, then be worked into other meals. Um, so, for instance, uh, you know, I like to do a roast chicken. Uh, right. and then you could have like the, the, um, the drumsticks. And then a couple of days later, we can use the, 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 the chicken breasts in, in, in chicken burgers, we got guacamole, some, uh, some pickled onions on top. Um, and then once you've done perhaps four chickens, you have a lot of, of, of chicken bones in your freezer. You know that from your phone. Uh, and then you can, <laughs> you can, you can cook a, a good chicken stock on, on sort of four, uh, sort of. Uh, chicken bones uh or do you call them carcasses yeah yeah right. okay. yeah, yeah you yeah, can yeah, yeah carcasses yeah. Work. so 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 uh stuff like that um i've i've, I've, I've tried to harness uh even better than, than i've done really. so, so you've not totally redecorated yet and changed uh, the color of your walls and uh um so in denmark it's it's i mean now i have a a, a yellow uh wall behind me but it, it's quite typical to have uh a lot of white walls because they reflect right. lighting better. Um, and Dane's quite obsessed about getting daylight and maybe it's because we are without it for a majority of the, <laughs> of the year. So, so that's something we've been, we've been, we've been mindful of. Um, and then also having, uh, what I call the sort of Viking proof seat, uh, sort of a, a, a chair with, 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 with my back to the wall. Uh, so, so no Viking can come up and sneak, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and attack on me. That, that's, that's what I need when I read and when I write. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Um, and I, I, I was, um, I was thinking the other day, another thing that seems to come up a lot recently in homes is, uh, is plants. Um, with, are there any particular plants that you should or shouldn't have? <laughs> like, 
And the ones that I you can, can keep alive, the ones that you can keep alive. <laughs> but, but you're right, uh, and, and and there's um, there's a chapter around that in in the book as well, because we can see from different studies that plants are being in contact with nature. Uh, has a positive impact on well-being. There's also plenty of studies that show that people recover from surgery faster if they have a view of, of green areas uh, compared to a, to a uh, boring wall. Um, so th there's a lot of, of benefits. Uh, there's, there's a whole sort of research area in biophilia, as, it, as, as it's called. All right. Um, but I, I see we have similar taste in, in, in plants, yeah. more or less the same there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anything unkillable uh, yes. is the... Is the... <laughs> Is the way for it. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise we end up stressing about it probably more. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I guess that thing on natural materials must be quite important. So plants are nice because they're you know, green and part of nature. So is it, did you find it was the same with sort of using more natural materials like wood and things like that? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a that's a big sort of trend, I would say, in Danish design. Right. That, that, that okay. sort of basically bring in nature into your living room. Uh, sort yeah. of, you know, think what would a Viking squirrel decorate his home like? Uh, so, <laughs> so, 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 wood material yeah. uh, is 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 big. But I think you know, uh, going back to what we talked about, the, the sort of Maslow hierarchy of needs. It's yes, the shelter, and yes, the love of belonging, um, and sort of self esteem, and also the the very top of of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a self actualization. So it's also understanding how we can create a home that inspires us to do what we would actually like to do, um, yeah. and remind of remind us of what we want to be reminded of. Now I, I see you in the background have the the wonderful books by Mike Viking, uh, and you have, <laughs> you have you have Legos and you have uh, yeah you have a Lego spaceship and is it a what is the, the one on the top got, of the shelf? That's a, uh, I've got a space um, shelf. A space shuttle. Um, right. Yeah, I've got a Saturn V rocket, a space shuttle. I've got a mini Groot from uh, from the Avengers film. Oh right, it's in the bookcase. Um, okay, yeah. Back to the Future car. Um, I've got I a mini that, Yoda. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great because I think we need to understand that that what you see is what you are reminded of, um, mm -hmm. and I have at the desk where I'm writing a lot of sort of mementos that remind me of some of the great times I've had in my life and some of the important lessons that I've learned. Um, and that helps me, for example, when, when I write uh, to sort of dive into those stories and, and, and you have sort of things that evidently brings you, you joy. And I think that's also what we need to understand that our homes can help us with, you know, use mementos as memory triggers of the good times that we have had or, or what actually brings us joy. Um, and, and that helps us, I think, with, with the whole sort of self-actualization uh, level of, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it is interesting. It says it, you, I know one of your tips in the book, um, again, I was reading from zooming into a picture, was surround yourself by the things that make you smile. Um, I guess that's a sort of similar thing. I find it interesting that in some rooms I want things to be very clean and clear. Uh, like the kitchen noise has to be pretty tidy. Um, same with the living room. Like I want to be able to walk in there and there's just not too many distractions. I can lie down and be comfortable. But then my, my study for me, I guess, being slightly wacky and creative, there's <laughs> always bits all over the place. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not, it's not super messy, but there's, you know, I'm surrounded here on this table by books and little photographs of things and little notes um but uh yeah it makes me feel comfortable and happy it's like my little little resting place yeah, little home. Um, yeah <laughs> yeah um but um i i uh, i thought the two things I, I i don't want to keep you for too long um but i thought um it would be lovely to to chat very briefly if we can just because since we last chatted you you've opened up the happiness museum as well so if anyone is traveling anywhere near Copenhagen or if someone is looking for a new country to go to, um, the, a good a good place to go to is now Copenhagen, even more than it was before, because uh, you can go and visit the, the Happiness Museum. Yeah. Um, it, yes. it looks amazing. It, it is, I mean, it's, 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 it's really fun um, to visit for me as a, as a happiness researcher also, because we, we ask people questions uh, and I get to see their answers. So, so 
the reason why we did the happiness museum was that we we got a lot of letters mails from people who wanted to come by and see the happiness research institute and <laughs> it's a boring office where we sit in front of computers and it you know it's not it's not boring you lied it was there was like when i last went there were just puppies rainbows <laughs> unicorns it was amazing um, <laughs> but we thought why don't we create an exhibition where people can come and explore some of the questions and answers that we are we are working with and and we put yeah. the the sort of knowledge we have into books and courses and uh, we teach at universities and we do reports and we thought a museum is also a way to communicate findings yeah. um so in the midst of the pandemic, uh, we, we opened uh, the Happiness Museum. And, and we like to say it's a, it's a small museum about the big things in life. And we nice. created different rooms uh, or we have different themes in the different rooms. So there's a, for instance, there's a, a room around the history of happiness. So how have the perception of the good life evolved over time? Uh, there's a room with the science of happiness. So how do crazy researchers like myself and my team try and, and, and quantify well-being. Um, and, and before you hit record, we, we, we also talked about my, my favorite room, which is where we have asked people to write down on post-its what happiness is to them. And now we have thousands of post-its and it's really fun as a researcher to go in there and see what, what do people define happiness is or what is happiness to people. And, um, you know, we, we see a lot of, people writing relationships, you know, wife, sister, husband, uh, brother, son, et cetera. Uh, we see a lot of people writing about food. Um, 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 we, we, uh, um, yeah, I, I told you this before you hit record. My, my favorite post-it is somebody who wrote that happiness is a good quality lawnmower and a big lawn to mow. Um, so I, a, a lot of sort of original, uh, original answers. Uh, we also have in, in a different room uh, around happiness, uh, the, the politics of happiness. We've asked the guests to write down which law they would pass if they were happiness minister. And I was, wow, I was down so there cool. on, uh, this week and I saw somebody had wrote that everybody should get a pair of corgis. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which epic. I thought was a was a was a nice policy proposal. So it's <laughs> it's 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 about happiness. Um, hopefully, people live a little wiser around uh, happiness research, and, and hopefully also a little yeah. uh, happier. Uh, and and our biggest hope is that that people become motivated even more to to make the world a, a little bit better. Uh, amen. And I, I I mean I remember when when we first met you, I think I asked you that question, as, which was what. Well, what would you do if you could, uh, if you could pass a law? And I think you, you said it was uh, that you would want everyone to have a best friend, uh, which I thought was absolutely incredible. But I don't think I ever asked you the question, which was, what is happiness to you? You, you said that you asked that question of your visitors. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> and I, I stand by my pro policy proposal that that everybody should get an additional uh, good friend or best friend and two porkies. <laughs> Um, and, <laughs> uh, my definition of happiness is, is, is of course, uh, biased because of my work, but I think the, the sort of best definition we have is, um, that happiness is the feeling of, uh, contentment, of joy, of positive emotions combined with the sense that your life is meaningful and worthwhile which is a horrible definition because it's, it's so, <laughs> so long, so wide and so complex, yeah. but, but that is what happiness is. It is complex and it yeah. is about sense of purpose and meaning. And it is about joy. It is about, you know, having a delicious burger with pickled onions. Um, <laughs> and it is about contentment. And I think we need to build all those things into the definition of happiness. We need to sort of, Acknowledge that happiness is a dish with many different ingredients on it. A good life is about building silly Lego space toys <laughs> and, and, and reading good books and having good conversations with your friends and, and, and your spouse and, and doing meaningful work. Um, so, so we need that, I think, wide uh, definition of, of, of happiness. Um, and that, of course, makes it challenging when we're trying to quantify because then exactly what part of the happiness definition are we talking about now? Um, but I think we, we, we have answers to that challenge as well.
Yeah, it's good to strive for those. Well. And, and and happiness is also having a conversation with you. Uh, you're amazing. Oh, so thanks. thank you. Um, so I got one last question before we 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 leave. Um, so I've started asking uh, silly questions to everyone when they come on. Um, and I thought thought of one that I thought might might work well for you. <clears throat> it says, would you rather be able to teleport anywhere you want to, any time? Or would you rather be able to look at a book and instantly absorb all the knowledge inside it? Um, uh, teleport. <laughs> so you do a lot of traveling, right? So I well. do, and I, I have I have friends and family in 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 places uh, that are, yeah. are are far from from my home, um, and it. it would mean I would get to see you more often, and and one of my my a couple of my good friends are, are John and Millie, who are uh, uh, living in Vancouver, and that's a long wow. flight. Um, yeah. um, and 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 my dad lives three hours away uh, in a car, and you know I think that would I'm 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 coming from this from a happiness point of view. Yeah, <laughs> I think having access to my friends and family members at an instant uh, would have a bigger marginal impact on my happiness than being able to download the knowledge from, from every book. Uh, I know I should say the other, being an author, uh, but I think there's also some pleasure in reading. Uh, so yeah, just being I able agree. to sort of download the knowledge is, 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 is you, know, it, you know, you could also, you know, down a protein, protein drink and then get the protein you need. Uh, but yeah. the chicken burger just tastes better. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with option A. Yeah, it's a good option. I think I'd, I'd take the same. Okay, um, I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would, uh, I, for pretty much the same reasons. I think it's, I, I think the one I would add is I think it would also allow me to sort of get a break really quickly. You know, be able to sort of just instantly go to uh, the middle of a forest and just be around nature um, is, is, is also pretty amazing. And sometimes it's quite hard when you're in a city to do that. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I agree. I think, I think people are just so valuable. It's just, it's, yeah, it's the thing I miss the most is sort of you know, when you're at school, you're always around your friends and then you, you become an adult and then yeah. you start having kids and all these other things happen. It gets harder and harder to meet up with people. Uh, so if there was some magical way to, just think it and, and suddenly be with your friends. It'd be great. Um, I agree. Maybe, maybe scientists can uh, get working on that while they're <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see what, I'll see what my team can do. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> but um, but one, look forward one, to that. one last thing, uh, Chris, I actually wrote about Legos in, in uh, the latest book um, because um, one, one thing, you know, can, I think it, it's quite rewarding to do, for example, Legos yeah. or puzzles, you know, that, that sort of feeling of the yeah. last Lego or piece of the puzzle, uh, sort of that sense of accomplishment or, you know, being the guy with the quality lawnmower and a big lawnmower. I think that's the sort of sense, <laughs> same sense of accomplishment we get from, from building Legos. But I think there's also, I think there's also an additional value in having that analog play uh, with friends or with, with family. Uh, and, you know, also if people have teenagers, um, I think it's good to, to to build Legos with them or do puzzles or board games instead of only having screen time together uh, because you, you will then be building something, your spaceship, for example, and you can build yeah. and you can also have a conversation that then doesn't sort of entail uh, awkward silences that you might be <laughs> having with your teenage sons. Um, um, so, so I think that's another... Um, sort of design hack, uh, because I think that can give you a different sort of communi a different sort of conversation uh, compared to sitting in front of your teenager or sitting next to them when you're watching telly. Um, so, so bringing out the Legos, bringing out the board games, bringing out the puzzles, I think that's, that's another um, hack that we just wanted to share. I agree. No, it's, it's super important and very, very valuable. Um, and thank you very much for sharing your valuable time uh, with no, us. Thank you, uh, Chris. And we need to get working so on that an honor. Uh, travel machine. Yeah, yeah, no, I can't wait. Well, um, I, I still can't wait to come to Copenhagen. Uh, I've still got a flight. It's still, still in credit with uh, with British <laughs> Airways. So hopefully, I can, 
come over and say hello soon and um and that give you a tour all the very sure. best for the book um for anyone's listening go to amazon.com or your local bookstore uh you can buy it right away um it's coming out on the I can't remember. september 29th september 29th okay marvelous fantastic so if you're listening on this to this after september the 29th good news just go to a bookstore you'll see it <laughs> and it's bigger than the other ones so you'll find it easily um but uh mike you're amazing thank you so so Very much um, thank you so much to you and the family and yeah uh look forward to chatting again soon likewise thank you thanks right